Okay, good evening. So we're no longer doing live broadcasts, I think, not in the immediate future. The live is, uh, well, doing it this way gives me the option of having better quality broadcasts, recordings. Anyway, most importantly, it's for you guys who are here doing the course. This is uh, the core of what I feel is my work as a, well, in, in sharing the Dhamma. Of course, the core of my work is my own, but in terms of sharing the Dhamma with others, the core of it, from my perspective, is you coming here to do the course, so I put myself at your disposal, and if there's anything you need, let me know. Part of it is giving regular talks, so I'm happy to do that for you. Just to give encouragement and background and direction. Trying to always keep it in line with the Buddha's teaching, not give you my perspective on things, but give you something that I think is greater than that and more valuable. It's the Buddha's perspective. So. Tonight I thought I would talk about something that seems to be, have been very important to the Buddha and it seems fairly easy to see why that is. And not just important to the Buddha but also important to his followers it seems. Because we know this because we have it uh, in several places, well we have it repeated. So something you might know about the Buddha's teaching as it's been recorded is there's a lot of repetition. But in this case it's quite curious because we have a set of discourses called the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. It's the one of the more prominent sets because there's 152 different talks that the Buddha gave and they're medium sized. They're not really the long ones, uh, but they're not also very short ones that are also collected. They're sort of in the middle and so they're a really good sort of entrance to the Buddhist teaching. There's just so much, such a diversity of topics. But one section near the end has, uh, I haven't counted them, but there's several repetitions of this teaching. And they're not very long. Um, but it's the same teaching again and again and it's the, the monks repeating it or the Buddha teaching it to them in various, in various situations. So it seems to have been a teaching of the Buddha that was kept very closely in mind by his followers. And once you hear it, you'll, I think, understand why. It's called the Badekarata, which means uh, a single excellent night. There's a bit of controversy about that translation. Some people translate it as uh, it's something else. It's because of how the there's an ambiguity in the word. But it, it fairly clearly, from my perspective, refers to having one good night. And in Pali, something you have to understand is the word night is used in the same sense that we use the word day in English. So when we talk about having a good day, they would talk about having a good night. Why we know that is because that's how they talked about uh, the passing of time. If you talk about how long something has gone on, you would say how many nights has it gone on. So instead of saying how many days you've been here, you say how many nights have you been here. When you talk about seniority, they would ask, uh, they, they would talk about it in terms of uh, having more nights. There's a term called Ratanyu, which means one who knows many nights. The Ratanyu is the most senior. So we have a monk in the Buddhist teaching. The most senior monk is called Anya Kundanya. He was the first ordained bhikkhu. Uh, and so he's called Ratanyu, one who knows, one who has lived through many nights. So when we hear Bade Karata, Eka means one, Bada, Bada is like Bhante, Bada means exalted, or they translate as excellent, but it really means something like exalted. When you put someone up high, you call them Badanta, or Badante, I think. 
Uh, Vedanta is a word you refer to someone who is high, who you put up like reverend or, or venerable. So having one uh, venerable knight, no, probably one exalted knight. But in colloquial terms, it just means having a good day. When you have a, a really good day, one good day. Because it, I mean, it's a way of describing what you need, what is required, what is the goal. The goal is this one moment where you see everything clearly. Getting to the point where you have a good day. Because it, it, it refers, or it, it hints back to the Buddha's good day, or the Buddha's good night. When the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and stayed up all night, and throughout the night, in the three watches of the night, he saw three different things. And the third watch was where he freed him, he became free from suffering. So it's in that, uh, in that vein that we think of having a good night. So this, the, the teaching goes, starts with something that should be very familiar to you. I repeat it and you have surely heard it from other places in Buddhism. Aditang nanwa gameya napatigang ke anagatang. Don't go back to the past or bring up the past. And don't worry about the future. Yadati tang pahinantang apatancha anagatang. What's in the past has gone already. What's in the future has not come. Not yet come. It's a fairly simple teaching. And it is, I think, a good doorway, a good uh, entrance to the practice of mindfulness to learn about being in the present moment. Being in the past and in the future, they're not the only problems, of course, um, but they're the first problem that we come to in meditation, the first challenge that we work on uh, in, is in terms of trying to keep our mind from planning, from living in the future, and to keep our mind from uh, dwelling in the past. It's a common problem that can become quite uh, intense for people when they are mourning loss or when they've had things happen to them in the past that were just traumatic. We had meditators who were traumatized so that they couldn't let go of the past. People who are worried about the future, anxious about the future, it can become quite a, an obsession. Of course, for all of us, it's a problem, right? When you finish the course, you know you start thinking about the future. Like it's 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 like a, a, a drilling into your head. You can't get it out. So pernicious, very strong. You'll, you'll notice it can be very strong. So uh, a, a very important teaching that's not mentioned here, but what this relates to is the Buddha's teaching on how it uh, how it um, the, what is the reality of living in the past and in the future. And he talks about, I think in, in the Jataka, he talks about it like when you cut grass. When you live in the past or when you live in the future, you're cut off from reality. And so your, your mind dries up like when you cut grass. Uh, there's, a, there's a verse that goes something like, For the past I do not mourn, nor for the future weep. I take the present as it comes, and thus my color keep. That's a translation of the Jataka that they turned into poetry. But the problem is when you live in the past or live in the future, it's an abstract, it's conceptual. It's a very different state of mind than being mindful. If you sit here and you're aware of the breath, you're aware of yourself sitting, you're aware of the sound you hear, you're aware of the sights and so on, you have a very simple connection with reality a very simple experience of things. And uh, so there's very little stress and, and it's very uh, not very taxing on the mind. When you start getting into the past and the future, by its very nature, it requires more mind work. And there's, of course, much more that can come up. If you see something, it's, it's, it's only very simple defilements that can come up. Maybe you like it or you dislike it. But if you get into th abstract thinking, so many, pro so many of your uh, f 
phobias or, or neuroses can come up. So many potential problems, addictions, and so on. Uh, so staying out of the past and the future it becomes a very important teaching. But there's another part to this. And it's sort of another step. There's two parts, two main parts to this teaching. So the next part goes, Pachupanancha yoda mang tata tata vipasati. And it's easy to sort of skip this one over because it says, whatever dhammas, yeah, whatever dhammas arise in the present moment in front of you, see them clearly. And so you might just take this as an extension of the first part where it, whereby we, okay, stay in the present, but it's not enough to be in the present. It's almost enough, or in a way it's enough. But it's not simply to be in the present, but it's to see the present clearly. And the commentary makes this clear. That oh No, the Buddha actually makes this clear when he talks about it. Um, he, just, he explains this after he gives this couple of verses. He explains it, and he says it's possible to be defeated by the present moment. Even when you're out of the past and out of the future, even the present moment, of course, can be a, a cause for the arising of conceptual thought, specifically uh, the arising of, of ego. The idea that this is me, this is mine, if you see something or you know, anything, you hear something, someone says to you, you're good, you're bad, if someone says good things about you, you're puffed up, if someone says bad things about you, you're angry or upset or depressed or lowered in your self-esteem. So it's not simply to be in the present moment, it's to see clearly in the present moment. The point being, you can only see the present, it's only the present moment that you can see clearly. It's not possible to see clearly about the past or the future, not in the way that the Buddha describes. A vipassati, if you caught that, that's just another form of the word vipassana. Vipassana is the noun, vipassati is the verb. One sees clearly. So seeing the present clearly is a description of what you're doing when you practice mindfulness, and it's the practice of mindfulness uh, that you know, is the heart of this teaching. It allows you to break through uh, conception, the co concepts, and abstract thinking, and see clearly reality, you know, just in a very simple sense of what's really there, not what you think is there, not what someone tells you is there not what you believe is there. Of course, there's so much that comes from that. You start to see suffering and wh why you suffer. You start to see your emotions, positive and negative, qualities of mind that are beneficial to yourselves and others, and harmful to yourselves and others. And you'll work through that. I mean, it's a process of change mindfulness, insight, clarity of mind changes so much. But hopefully you can start to see that it cleans so much. That's the essence of the Badekarata teaching. The rest is more like a pep talk. I mean, it's a very beautiful teaching. It's just very short and concise. That's the first half. Um, my teacher, this is one of the things he said most. Anytime anyone was in the past or in the future, which of course often happens, he would repeat this verse in Pali and then just the first part and then uh, translate it into, into Thai. It's a very powerful one. And it's expressed in many different ways in the Buddhist teaching. But here this verse is literally repeated several times in a row in several suttas. So the next part relates more to why we should do this. And it's sort of a classic carrot and stick, talking about the dangers if you don't, or, or the bad stuff, reasons why you should, because there's bad things and, and the good things that come of it. So the first part is, asanghi ranga sankupang. This is unshakable, this is invincible. Tangvidva manu bruheye. One should be sure of this. Knowing this, one should be sure of it. Something like that. I want to pause here because this is, I think, a very important statement. And I mentioned this. I mention this often to meditators and and in my talks about how how.
perfect and uh, potent, you know, how, how uh, efficacious, it's a big word, means how this practice is able to bring about results. So when we think of all of the methods and, and schemes and plans we have for finding happiness and peace and, and stability and so on, all of our plans and ambitions, they, they fall short. They can't help but fail because they're not permanent. They don't lead to something that's permanent. I mean, the, the idea of a thing that is permanent is a red herring in the first place. If you try to create stability in your life, you know that that's only temporary. If you try to create pleasure, you should know that that's only temporary as well. And, and problematic because these attempts that we make get us into dependency. And that's the key is because seeing clearly and being mindful and being in the present moment is independent, you can never be taken away from the present moment. No one can say to you, nah, we're going to, we're going to put you over here and, and, and remove you from the present moment. It's experience is the one thing that no one can take away from you. So if, if experience becomes your refuge rather than a, a curse or, or something that you're constantly running away from, and that, which is a very important point, that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. We're so afraid or incapable of being in the present moment that we are always running into the past or the future, chasing after pleasures, chasing after things that can't possibly satisfy us. That, we, that the present is something so unfamiliar scary, um, uninteresting, you know, repulsive almost. And if, if we can change that you know, by coming to be present and be uh, alert, you know, have a clarity of mind about it, we become invincible. That's an important word. The only way you can become invincible is if you're able to accept everything. If you're able, not accept, but able to be unfazed, unmoved, unshaken. Asang hirang, asang kupang. And so this is an important thing for you to understand and to, to get a sense of. Regardless of what results you've gained from the practice otherwise, like peace or happiness or all these good things we talk about. Knowing that is, is far more powerful. Because if you do the right thing, this is an important concept as well, if you do the right thing, you know, whatever that means, once you get a sense that this is the right thing, if you're clear on that, you don't have to ever worry about what's going to be the result. You don't have to say, okay, I'm doing the right thing, but is it going to lead to good things? It's such a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the wrong question. It's, a, it's an absurd question. Because the only way it could be right is, is if it were leading to good things. And if you do that, it helps very much to overcome doubt. Where you don't have to worry about results ever. And it's a very important quality of mindfulness that you never worry about results. You're always focused on, is it right? Is, is, is this truly unshakable? Is this truly invincible? Am I truly doing something? And, and, and doing something that... that uh, will make me safe. And, and, and the reason why we can say that, that this is the case with such assurance is because of how simple it is, because of how pure it is. I'm not telling you to believe in God or believe in the Buddha or pray or do rituals or, or take on faith some doctrine or so on. I'm saying see clearly what's here and now, right? So when this becomes the teaching, the core teaching with nothing else, unadulterated, then you can have perfect confidence if you're, if you're straight in your own mind. You can have perfect confidence that it's the right thing. That it's, it is what it says to be. And then the next part. Ajeva ki chamatabang atapang ko janya maranang sue. Another important part of it that's often repeated. Ajeva ki chamatapang. Today the the task should be done with effort 
Today the work should be done with effort. Gojanya maranang suve. Who knows whether death, death might come even tomorrow. So this is why we, one of the reasons anyway, it's an important reminder. We don't know what's coming in the future. We don't know death, probably not, because it's not the most common thing for someone to die, though absolutely there's a chance that any one of us in this room or listening here could, could die tomorrow. Nobody knows. But anything could happen. Someone near you could die. Someone, uh, you, could, uh, gain, you could lose something, you could get sick. Anything could happen. There could be a tsunami, you know, when we were in Thailand and the tsunami came. How many people, their whole life was destroyed, even if they did survive the, the horror of the aftermath of that big tsunami. Anything can happen. So we do the work today, get ready, because all of that relates to change. And it's change that creates this instability and, and suffering. And so the inv part of being invincible is the being flexible, being able to adapt. How can you adapt? By making your base and your refuge experience. Because once you understand and are familiar with experience and are unfazed and unshaken by it, then you've covered everything because there's nothing but experience. There's no bargaining with it. Death. There's no bargaining with death. Death with its great army, Mahasenena. Yeah, death. Death is. I mean, it is special. You could talk about talk like this about anything, but. Death is a very good example, and probably the prime one. Because, well, we don't know where, not only do we not know when it's going to come, we, we know that it is going to come. And it's very much, it's quite a vivid imagery, this idea of death with its armies. I see that if you, well, you guys, some of you are fairly young, but as you get older and people start dying around you, you start to get a sense of death being like an army. I mean, I'm still young, I'm 40, but, uh, you know, as my gr three of my grandparents are gone, I had a cousin fall off a roof a few years ago, he's dead. My stepfather just found out he has cancer. Death is coming, and we can feel the fortress weakening around us. You look and you see, you're getting crow's nests, gray hair, uh, arthritis, uh, you're getting fat and old and your mind is growing weak and so on. You can feel death pounding down your pounding down the doors. Mahasenena, great armies. It's not just one threat. It's like, like one of those horror movies and you're in the house and, and people start dying around you and you just know you're next. May I say it with a smile because we kind of have something powerful against it, and that's this teaching. I mean, really, the essence of the Madhikarata Sutta. So then the Buddha says, "Evang viharing ataping, ahora tamatanditan." One uh, working thus day and night, ahora tam. Atanditang, not flagging, not relaxing, not, not slagging, lag, uh, slagging, no, what's the word? Slacking off. Tang we badekarato di. Such a person is called a badekarata, one who has a single excellent night, has a good night, a good day. Santo Ajikate Muni. Santo Ajikate Muni. I'm not sure if that's calling, I think that might be calling the Buddha, talking about the Buddha as being, 
peaceful. Actually, I'm not, yeah, I think it's the peaceful sage. Thus says the Buddha, who is the peaceful sage. But I wanted to highlight the word santa, santo achikate muni. So the Buddha was a muni, he was wise, but he was always pe also peaceful. And I wanted to highlight that word because, well, again, that's what you should gain from the practice. Ultimately, it is about finding peace. You stay in the present moment, you learn about reality, you become more comfortable and more familiar with the way you, your own mind works. So much changes, and what changes is the stress and the you know, chaos in the mind, the suffering in the mind is reduced, and there's a great peace that comes from that. So, I've, I've gotten into the habit of wishing people to have a good day, and, and now you know it wasn't just because of being polite. I think it's a good politeness. Wishing people to have a good day is kind of a secret way of wishing for them to have a real good day, an exalted day, an excellent day, an excellent night, where they are able to find true peace and free themselves from stress and suffering. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for listening. Have a good night. Oh, I have to turn this off as well, right?